Disclaimer, this documentary is for educational purpose only to provide information and spread awareness regarding the issue. Viewer discretion is advised. Most people are familiar with the term rape but not incest. Before starting the topic, let's talk about incest. Incest is defined as the crime of having sexual intercourse with a close relative such as a parent, child, sibling or grandchild. It is basically a member of the family regardless of the degree. Throughout history, there are cases of incest practiced mostly amongst the royalties such as King Charles II of Spain, known as the Hex due to his severe deformities, England's Queen Victoria who caused her descendant to suffer from hemophilia, and King Tut and Cleopatra who were married to their siblings. It is without a doubt that the effects of incest or rebuilding are severe and can cause genetic complications, physical deformities, mental disorder, incurable health issues as well as producing high rate of stillborn children. The Nevertheless, the royalty view this practice as the key to find peace to the throne or to keep the royal bloodline pure. Even in the 21st century, incest still exists but was kept as a taboo in the society. However, unlike the royals, incest among the citizens was due to genetic sexual attraction, a phrase popularized by Barbara Gonio in the 1980s. Every year, around a quarter of a million adoptions take place around the world. But what happens when these adopted children become adults and set out to find their biological families? By their nature, reunions are bound to be emotional events. But there's one unexpected feeling that's putting ordinary people into a very unusual situation. You ever been in love? That's what it's like. <laughs> you can't stay away from the person. You want to talk to them every minute. You want to be with them every minute. And, uh, and when you're not, you know, it's very uncomfortable. You want to just be with that person all the time. It's a different sort of love. It's a, it's a stronger love. Than, than just well, it's meeting. Well, not a father-daughter love. No, it's not a father-daughter love at all. I did take to her immediately, you might say. But of course, it dawned on me that this wasn't what you would call a natural feeling for a sister. He's not my brother to me, and he never will be. We're not the only people living or feeling these things. Well, it's, it's been devastating. Oh, uh, there's been so much loss and, and pain. It's been like a bad dream. These are everyday people who have found themselves in a passionate affair with a long-lost sibling or parent they thought they'd lost through adoption. Most are in hiding, but others are starting to speak out about their unusual relationships and fighting for their right to stay together, forcing us to ask the question, is incest the last taboo? After Adoption in Manchester is one of four agencies in the UK who offer support for people who find themselves in one of these relationships, known as Genetic Sexual Attraction, or GSA. Janie Lloyd-Lewis, an adoptee herself, has been counselling adopted adults for 16 years. After years of meeting clients experiencing GSA, she decided to create an information pack about the issue. Janie herself is no stranger to the powerful feelings GSA can create. When I finally traced my birth mother, it was undeniably the most exciting, emotional, surreal, and wonderful feeling I've ever, ever had before or since. That feeling of intense love and very, very, very sensual. Just the touch of her when we hugged, and I think more than anything else, it was the smell. It just was familiar, even though I'd been separated from her since birth. It's not abnormal to have these feelings, but of course it is devastating when it break, the boundaries are broken and both sides do develop into se having a sexual relationship because sadly they not only probably destroy any future relationship, but for those around them. However, incest become more complicated when rape is involved. According to a report investigating violence against women in Malaysia, it shows a significant increase from 2000 to 2009. The highest number of rape and incest cases reported was in 2009, with more than 3,600 rape cases and more than 300 incest cases. 
Another parliamentary report for rape in 2014 shows that 90% of rape involved girls between 13 and 16 years old and shockingly, 80% of accused perpetrators were known by the victims. Various studies had confirmed that most rape and incest activity occurs in families of low socioeconomic level and are relatively uneducated. 66% of the perpetrators were found to be Malays and 82% were over 50 years old. Most perpetrators would blame on others including their victims as they are the most vulnerable while some blame on their own culture or religion quoting that incest is allowed in the Quran. In January 11, 2011, three young girls from Kuching had become sex slaves for their 57-year-old grandfather and 35-year-old uncle for two years after the parents of the three girls had divorced. The mother of the young girls found out that her eldest daughter was pregnant when she came to visit the girls and immediately made a police report. Ironically, religion and cultures in general prohibit rape and incest. In Islam, rape is without a doubt prohibited and the punishment for committing incest is to be executed. But, it was the misconception and the misinterpretation of the surah in the Quran that resulted rape and incest in an Islamic nation. In the Quran, Surah 423 speaks about the various types of marriage relationships that are forbidden in Islam. However, the list does not include the incestuous marriage between a father and his illegitimate daughter. The majority of knowledgeable Quran scholars have said that, if a man commits adultery with a woman, the act does not prohibit him from marrying her, and a marriage between a man and the daughter he commits through adultery is also permissible, explained in Surah 25. However, if a man has an illegitimate child, it means he had committed the crime of premarital sex. According to the Islamic law, he or she who commits such a crime will be stoned if married, 100 lashes and banishment for one year if he or she is not married. Usually, a hundred lashes will result death. Even if he or she survive, it will cause the individual to serve post-traumatic stress disorder and even become suicidal. Therefore, the chances of a marriage between a father and his illegitimate daughter are unlikely to be successful. Although Malaysia does not strictly follow Islamic law, if a Muslim perpetrator claims that the Quran allows incest, it is definitely an excuse. Not to mention, rape is absolutely unlawful regardless of race, culture or religion in any country around the world. It is estimated that only 20% of rape and incest cases are reported with only 3% actually convicted. Victims may not report the tragedy due to the lack of the system available or a host of other factors such as not receiving financial support from the breadwinner who commit the incest. Furthermore, due to the issue's delicate and sensitive process for detailed investigation, the government had been found suppressing the issue in mainstream media as many articles regarding the issue have been blocked in many social media and news websites. Moreover, social stigma and stereotypes regarding rape and incest contribute to the disclosing of the issues and unfair justice for the victims. Most communities believe that it was the flirtatious behaviors or personalities that caused rape and incest. Politicians around the world, including Malaysia, objectify women's body image and urge women to cover themselves to prevent false accusations that would lead to rape or incest. However, Rape and other sexual assaults were not about sexual attraction and gratification but control over dominance. A research made by interviewing 90 convicted rapists in Malaysia found more than 50% of the men agreed that women needed to be taught and showed the right way to pleasure men and they were created to fulfill men's desire. Besides that, they believe that men are meant to lead women. These are the truths of the perpetrator's need of dominance and control over a person that caused rape and incest. It is also an opportunistic act of violence. In some cases, it may be due to the perpetrator's own sexual fetishes. Furthermore, judging a woman's vulnerability and the way she dresses is easier for the perpetrators to transfer blames on the victim. Sadly, when a rape and incest victim is convinced with a child of their perpetrators, abortion became an option. Again, 
Social stigma plays a huge role in forcing the mother to abort the baby. The society thinks that the mother should abort the baby to prevent more psychological and mental stress towards the victim and their family members. Most victims who had aborted the baby had said to regret their decision. Not to mention, abortion can lead to potential health risks and even may result death towards mothers in the future. Therefore, most countries only allow abortion when a woman's life, physical and mental health is in danger. Most importantly, it should always be the mother or victim of sexual assault's choice and intellectual decision whether to abort or not. The option should always be open and society should respect the decision made by the victims. At the age of 17, after having lived most of my life in an abusive situation with extended family, uh, I conceived through incestuous rape. I, uh, I, I was very confused and I was very pressured by family members and by friends around me to abort my child. I had been raised in the church. Uh, I was a born again Christian and I understood that this was a life and I understood at 17 years old that I wasn't gonna take that life. I had an aunt and uncle that were very instrumental in helping me make decisions about keeping my child or adopting my child out, but very supportive in not aborting. I also had a minister that helped me to find a place to go and live. Uh, I went to a Salvation Army maternity home and lived there for the duration of my pregnancy. And the Salvation Army did see to my, my clothing, my food, my medical care. My child was conceived in rape. That doesn't make her less than human. My child has been a huge blessing in my life. She's been the light of my life and she's been the reason that I've become the human being that I am. Had I had an abortion, I would have remained in the situation that I was in. And my pregnancy and my daughter gave me purpose. It gave me something to strive for and it gave me hope for a better life. The idea that a woman who is raped has a right to kill a child is completely negative. It doesn't help the woman and it doesn't help the baby. A woman is stronger than that. A woman does not need to be told she should kill a child in order to feel better about what happened. It's not going to make the rape go away. It just means that now I've been raped and now I'm the mother of a dead baby also. It just heaps insult upon injury. Women are stronger than this. Women don't need to abort their children in order to uh, get past a rape. Their children will help them get past a rape. Producing life and producing something very positive from a negative experience is very empowering for women. The society and the government had wrongly accused rape, incest, and other sexually assaulted victims based on their own perspective and false opinion rather than thinking critically and consider the whole situation and picture about the issue. The actual fact and stereotypes regarding rape and incest should be spread amongst the society to prevent citizens further believing in myths. In fact, the government could employ more efficient and strict punishment towards sexual offenders to prevent further tragedies as it is obvious that the current laws and punishment are not enough to justify the victims. Besides that, health and psychological support are needed and should be provided to ensure the victims' physical and mental health is well cared to overcome their traumatic experiences. <laughs>